Hi, my name is Michael Gamry. I'm the technical partner at HLB Manjad in Melbourne. In the past couple of years, we've run various sessions for our not-for-profit group on the impact of the new revenue standards for not-for-profits. In this webinar, I intend to drill down into one particular topic that seems to cause some difficulty for people, and that's the concept of identifying sufficiently specific performance obligations. There are two main standards that govern income recognition for not-for-profits. WSB 1058, Income of Not-for-Profits, is, as the name suggests, a standard specifically applicable to not-for-profit entities. WSB 1058 covers transactions where the consideration to acquire an asset is significantly less than fair value, principally to enable an NFP to further its objectives. To try and put that more simply, we're talking about the type of scenario where an NFP receives an asset, but the cost of receiving that asset is less than the asset's fair value. Such a scenario usually occurs where an asset is provided to help an NFP to further its objectives. Generally speaking, when accounting under WSB 1058, income tends to be recognised on receipt. There are, however, some exceptions, the most significant of which being capital grants. WSB 15 Revenue from Contracts with Customers is a standard that applies to both for-profit and not-for-profit entities. The standard is written largely with, with for-profit entities in mind, which can make it difficult for NFPs to know how to apply it to their circumstances. The standard does, however, provide guidance for not-for-profits in Appendix F. WSB 15 is a relatively long standard and it can be easy to put it down before you get to Appendix F. However, if you're an NFP organisation, I strongly recommend that you look at it. It's relatively short, about five pages, and provides some really helpful guidance on how the principles of WSB 15 apply in the not-for-profit context. An NFP will be accounting for income under WSB 15 where three things exist. There's a contract with a customer, and it's important to note, as per the speech bubble there, that the customer will be the organisation providing the asset. For example, the government in the case of a government grant. But the customer does not necessarily need to receive the goods or services under the contract. That is, the asset provider can direct the goods or services are provided to a third party. For example, a group of beneficiaries or the community more generally. The second point is that the contract needs to be enforceable. And finally, the contract needs to contain sufficiently specific performance obligations. Now for this session, because I intend to drill down into the concept of sufficiently specific performance obligations only, I won't be covering identifying when a contract with a customer exists or whether such a contract is deemed enforceable. In examples I'll run through later, it's assumed that both of these factors have already been confirmed. So, before we start to consider the concept of sufficiently specific, let's first focus on identifying what constitutes a performance obligation. Contracts and funding agreements tend to be rather long and can contain a lot of detail. As such, it can be difficult to sift through all that information and identify what actually represent performance obligations. From my own experience reading contracts and funding agreements, there are three main categories that stand out when looking for performance obligations. Firstly, we have what I refer to as administrative requirements. For example, the requirement to produce quarterly progress reports, the requirement to comply with particular laws and regulations, or the requirement to hold monthly progress meetings. None of these items represent a distinct promise to transfer goods or services, and as such, they don't represent performance obligations. The second group I refer to as goals and objectives. These include things like mission statements and overall objectives. Again, they don't represent a promise to transfer goods or services, and thus are not performance obligations. Finally, we have outputs. Outputs represent distinct promises to transfer goods or services. They may be further broken down by details such as nature, cost and time frame. Such promises will generally represent performance obligations. Having identified performance obligations within a contract, the next step is to determine whether those performance obligations are sufficiently specific. When trying to figure out whether a performance obligation is sufficiently specific, one thing that is helpful to keep in mind is the five-step model for revenue recognition under WSB 15. The five-step model includes the requirement to identify performance obligations, allocate the transaction price to those performance obligations, and then recognize revenue as performance obligations are satisfied. If you're not able to perform those steps, for example, if it's not possible to ascertain when a performance obligation is satisfied, then the likelihood is that the performance obligation is not sufficiently specific. A high level of judgment is required. Unfortunately, it's not always clear-cut whether or not a performance obligation is sufficiently specific. 
In addition to reading the terms of the contract or agreement, I'd also recommend that you consider what other documents or information may form part of the enforceable agreement. For example, grant funding is often provided following a formal application process. If the requirement to perform in accordance with the application forms part of the enforceable agreement, it will be necessary to read the application and consider whether it includes sufficiently specific performance obligations. In considering whether performance obligation is sufficiently specific, consider whether specifics such as the nature, cost, quantity or time period are specified. And as I mentioned previously, don't forget to refer to the NFP specific guidance in Appendix F of WSB 15. Paragraphs F20 to F27 specifically cover the identification of performance obligations. So, next I'd like to run through a few examples to try and help illustrate the idea of identifying whether sufficiently specific performance obligations exist. In this first example, which is an extract from a grant agreement, it states various project objectives including establishing an events bureau, developing a marketing and promotional campaign, implementing a market and promotion campaign targeting specific subgroups, managing the target market campaign, and initiating opportunities for pre and post conference packages. At first glance, it's easy to see why someone might read that part of a funding agreement and think that sufficiently specific performance obligations exist. There's a lot of detail and including the breakdown into subgroups. However, for want of a better word, I'd describe this as waffle. There are various statements, but they, would all, they are all very general. If we flick back to the earlier slide, I would put these in the middle category of high level goals and objectives. Coming back to my previous comment about the five step model in WSB 15, how would you allocate the transaction price to these points or, or know when um, they have been satisfied? It's unclear in this example exactly what is required. Now let's look at another example taken from a grant agreement. Here we have a table containing quantities, time frames, and other information. Again, there's a lot of detail and it's easy to see how someone might think that these represent performance obligations. However, if we look closer, the actual requirements here are all administrative in nature and don't really transfer goods or services. If we flip back again to the earlier slide, I would put these in the first group, administrative requirements, being mainly reporting requirements. So let's look at a third example, again an extract from a grant agreement. It states that the grant is designed to support the transition of NDIS registered providers to meet certain requirements and that it is designed to drive consistent regulation, support providers to meet the conditions of registration, maintain and stimulate strong and diverse markets and stimulate continuous improvement among NDIS providers. Again, this information is all very general and I would put it in the high level goals and objectives category this particular extract is from a template agreement that is used for various organizations and thus without being tailored to the specific recipient organization, it's unlikely to contain sufficiently specific performance obligations. But let me bring up some further information from this same agreement. Now I apologize for the pink highlighting. This is a scan of an agreement I reviewed and unfortunately I don't have the original clean copy. However, I wanted to show it as it illustrates an important point. It states that the grantee agrees to use the grant in accordance with this agreement and the relevant grant details. The scope clarifies the items that comprise the agreement, which include the grant details and any other document ref referenced in the grant details. We then have an extract from the grant details section titled Project Delivery Plan and Budget. It states that the grantee must provide a project delivery plan and budget, which is subject to approval by the Commonwealth, the grant provider. It states that the project delivery plan will outline how the grantee will deliver the activity and should include targets, milestones, deliverables, products, timeframes, etc. So in this case, because the project delivery plan is required to be approved by the funding provider and forms part of the agreement, it would be necessary to review that document to ascertain whether it contains sufficiently specific performance obligations. In this next example, I just want to draw your attention to 4.3 outlined in red. This clause states that the administering institution must ensure that the activity is conducted in accordance with the application. Similar to the previous example, since the application forms part of the enforceable agreement, 
it will be necessary to read the application and consider whether it contains sufficiently specific performance obligations. Last funding agreements can often be quite generic, which is not surprising as they often come from a central template used for various grantees. It's the separate items such as applications, delivery plans and other schedules that may contain more specific detail. It's therefore important to consider such other information. It is also these items that can give the grant recipient some input in determining the requirements of the agreement. Next I'd like to run through a few more simplified scenarios. Real funding agreements are rather long so it's difficult to always use real examples. These next scenarios are therefore very simplified but I just want to try and illustrate the fine line between what may be considered sufficiently specific or not. So in this first scenario, the NFP receives a grant to improve literacy in rural areas through the provision of materials and running of classes. Would that be considered sufficiently specific? In my opinion, it wouldn't. It's a general statement and you'd struggle to allocate the transaction price to a performance obligation or determine when a performance obligation was satisfied. So next, an NFP receives a grant to improve literacy in rural areas through the provision of materials and running of classes over a period of three years. So the difference here is that we now have a time frame. Does that make it sufficiently specific? Again, in my opinion, it doesn't. A time frame alone is not enough to make a performance obligation sufficiently specific. So next we have similar information with the addition of the requirement that the organization must run one two hour class per week over a period of three years. Is this sufficiently specific? I would say that it is. We still have a time frame, three years, but we also now have a specific requirement to run one two-hour class per week. This would be enough information to be able to allocate the transaction price and determine when the performance obligation is satisfied and thus when revenue should be recognised. The final scenario states that an NFP receives a grant to improve literacy in rural areas through the running of classes. The organisation must provide a total of 1,000 teaching hours during a three-year period. Is this sufficiently specific? I would say that it is. Again, the requirement to provide 1,000 teaching hours allows for the transaction price to be allocated and satisfaction of the performance obligation to be determined. Okay, so finally I just want to recap some of the key takeaways from this session. Assessing revenue recognition under WSB 15 and 1058 is complex and may require organisations to review funding agreements in a greater level of detail than they have previously. You'll be accounting under WSB 15 if you have all three of a contract with a customer, enforceability and sufficiently specific performance obligations. A significant degree of judgement is required. I would suggest that you document the judgments you have made and the thought process behind the conclusions reached. Don't underestimate the complexity involved and therefore the time that is required. The examples in this session were simplified, but in reality agreements can be very complex and the correct treatment is not always clear cut. And finally, do seek help if you need it. As I said at the outset, that was a relatively high level summary of just one small topic from WSB 15. If you require help or further information, whether on this topic or NFP accounting more generally, please don't hesitate to get in touch. I'm very happy to take calls and discuss any questions you may have. Thank you for watching.